Professor Dave, Billy Carson, let's go. So when you're reading things like the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, for people who don't know, is one of the oldest versions of a lot of the stories that you hear in the Bible. Very, very similar yes. to them. They seem to be, there always seems to be a great flood. There's a few heroes. Mm -hmm. There's angry gods. There's a yeah. bunch of stuff going on. Joe said something smart. Ancient Mesopotamian myths were recycled to develop Hebrew mythology, something most Christians don't know and don't want to know. But more importantly, he just totally dismantled the dumb thing that Billy said, and neither of them pick up on it. So, let me agree with that last part, and then completely, absolutely despise everything he just said other than that very last part, right? No, they didn't. Because, and, the, and David alert, alluded to this earlier, I really think, if you have a bunch of different cultures that are, I don't know, telling a similar story, and they're all alluding to the historicity of this story, like, I don't know, a great flood? I'm just saying, maybe it's not myth maybe it's history that stems from an original source because that's the claim you have a flood that from my understanding can be argued that this happened during the younger driest period um shout out to y files who we just critiqued but i learned something from them but if you're interested in that check out the younger driest that's a that's a very interesting claim um but anyway the point is is that why does this idea of an ancient flood, and we're going to look at similarities and differences between ancient Mesopotamian mythology, as Dave calls it, and Hebrew mythology. Um, and you're going to find out really quick that the two are so far apart, like they're on different ends of the spectrum here. Um, but, but, oh, okay. They have a similarity. They have a flood story. That makes sense to me that that flood story, if if how the Bible describes it is true, if how di all these different cultures that you have one guy that survived, that repopulated the earth, that these different st or that story would be handed down. I mean, I'm just saying it makes sense, right? Like, am I the only one in this um, that, no. that agrees with that? Because I mean, <sighs> go ahead, go ahead, Josh. I was going to say, if you have, if you have people with, okay, imagine, and we have a hard time conceptualizing this, uh, except for the people who are, you know, uh, a little older than ourselves before the internet, before telephones, before radios and TVs, people didn't have contact with each other. Gasp. Guess Whoa. what? The guys who, who wrote one thing didn't write another thing that it was very difficult and to be honest with you stories that old weren't written in the way that we're thinking of writing at this point anyway they were told they were recorded but they weren't written like like dale pointed out earlier they're not didactic texts with a with a, a list of dogmas and a and a a historical continuity to one from one idea to another even even some of the later things that people have constructed that are very legendary. If you read the, I don't know if anybody who's listening has read the Arthurian legends. Mm -hmm. You can make an interesting story of them, but they are not linear, right? Like they're not they're not exactly made to be linear. They're episodic. You know what I mean? And so a lot of the things that that are recorded in ancient mythologies are episodic and not linear in, in the way that we want them or expect them to be in the first place. And yet the scripture opens up and is from the beginning remarkably linear. And so you you get this, and this is what Lewis called the, the pagans having good dreams, right? But then God comes along with an explicit revelation to the people of Abraham and and, and wonderful. That's wonderful, right? But it's like, why would why would there then be skepticism because there's overlap? If you had peer-reviewed uh, science, the overlap is the is actually the reliability, rather than a disqualifier. So it's just a weird cynicism that's guiding his thinking here. Dell, any comment before we get into similarities and differences? Um, why well, I, I, I yeah, I think it might be best. Let's 
uh, my points related to the similarities and differences, but okay. it's kind of countering uh, this point of dependence, like the assumption yeah. that the Bible is dependent on these pagan myths. Uh, actually, we can prove historically the opposite is true. The pagan myths copied the Bible, and we can prove it. Um, so, yeah, do you, where do you think that fits better? Uh, let's, yeah, let's jump into the similarities and differences and then we, and then you can bring up that point. Okay, cool. All right. So with that being said, I did some research and looked up, spent an interesting amount of time listening to things like Enuma Elish, Epic of Gilgamesh, looking at the different hymns that we have from the cuneiform. Now I'm not going to be as bold as Billy Carson to say, yeah, guys, you can read the cuneiform online. Yeah, that's true, but I don't know cuneiform. I'm relying on different scholars who have translated these texts. Um, but here's the thing that I've noticed. And I've wrote them down here, so let me just read what I've got here. And um, and I think we'll see very, very uh, soon that, <laughs> yeah, there are some similarities, but it's not what y'all might think it is. So the first one we've got, creation stories. Both mythologies have creation narratives. In Sumerian mythology, the story of the creation of the world and humanity is depicted in texts like the Enuma Elish and the Atrahasis, excuse me, epic. Uh, Hebrew mythology presents its creation story in the book of Genesis. So there's creation stories, guys. Whoa. Uh, divine beings are another similarity. So mm -hmm. both mythologies feature pantheons of gods and goddesses with distinct roles and powers. In Sumerian mythology, prominent deities include Anu, Enlil, and Inanna. Hebrew mythology includes figures such as Yahweh, angels, and supernatural beings like cherubim and seraphim. Number three, flood stories. Both cultures have the flood myth. The Sumerian flood story appears in the epic of Atrahasis, and a similar tale is found in the Epic of Gilgamesh. In Hebrew mythology, the flood story is recounted in the story of Noah's Ark. All right, so far we're, we've got creation, divine beings, and the flood. All right, what, what's next? Cosmology. Both mythologies share a similar cosmological outlook, viewing the universe as ordered and under divine control. They depict a hierarchical structure within the divine realm above, and the earthly realm below. All right. Number five, ethical teachings. Did y'all know Sumerian mythology actually had moral teachings found within it? <laughs> Crazy, <Yes>. right? Bastards. <laughs> Both mm -hmm. mythologies contain moral teachings and guidelines for human behavior, often conveyed, often conveyed, excuse me, through stories and laws. For instance, the Code of Hammurabi in Samaritan uh, Sumerian culture and in the Mosaic Law in Hebrew culture provide ethical and a legal framework. Uh, and guys, that's it. That's it. So we have creation story. We have divine beings. We have similar cosmology in the sense that divine beings rule in a hierarchical sense, the heavens and earthly humans in a hierarchical sense rule the earthly realm. We have flood stories or a flood story, I should say. And we have ethical teachings. Ha! Huh. Something you can hmm. find in literally every pagan religion. So I just don't, I, I don't see it, right? Like, I don't understand how this, these similarities specifically can, like, Christians don't want to know about this. Like, yeah, we do. Like, this is something we love because it's not like what Professor Dave is kind of making it out to be. Like, there's not this idea that we copied one for one. There's not an idea, and Dale's going to sh show this here in a minute, that there is this idea that, you know, we copied it all, right? Right. But now, let's get into some details about the actual differences because I found this this is what, in my opinion, separates Hebrew mythology from this cosmological um, pantheon of gods that the Sumerians believed in, right? And so let me uh, pull my notes up real quick. Okay, so the very first thing right off the bat, monotheism versus polytheism. 
So ancient Hebrews, they believe their central belief is in monotheism with Yahweh as the one true God. There is no other gods. We see this in Deuteronomy. We see this in Exodus. We see this all throughout the law. The earliest portion of the Hebrew text that we have, the Bible, the Old Testament, it all starts out one God, not many. There's one. The nature of the gods, ancient Hebrews, Yahweh is considered omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent with a personal, Josh, there you go, God's a person, um, and moral nature. He interacts directly with humans, but in ancient Sumerians mythology, gods and goddesses are anthropomorphic, beings with human-like emotions, flaws, and behaviors. They often intervene in human affairs and possess specific domains of influence. See the Enuma of Leash. Uh, we actually have jealous and, and gods that kill each other over their jealousy. Uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but the flood story, because uh, Enlil uh, was annoyed by the humans making too much noise on the earth, that's why he decided to come flood it. Inky comes and warns uh, who we would call Noah, and that's how the flood myth. So the only similarities is really one guy and a flood and that's about it. The reason God floods the earth, Yahweh floods the earth, is because of sin, not because people are being too loud. Shocker. Uh, yeah. The third, cosmology and creation. So now we're going to get into, yep, they believe that in gods that interacted and a god that interacted, and then a hierarchical structure in the heavens and a hierarchical structure here on earth. But here's the difference. Creation is portrayed in a singular event in Hebrew mythos, right? It's a, it's a portrayed as a singular event initiated by Yahweh who creates the world and everything in it out of nothing, ex nihilo. Humans are created in the image of God, but with the ancient Sumerians, creation stories involve multiple gods collaborating and conflicting in the creation of the world and humanity. And by the way, it's not ex nihilo. It's not out of nothing. They're all using things that um, was already there. And the stories like a Numa Leash don't really tell you how they got there. Um, it just kind of leaves it open-ended. So I don't know. But anyway, uh, creation is often depicted as a result of divine conflict and natural processes. Now, I don't know the exact story with the Sumerians, but I know, for example, and I'm not trying to get over PG here, but if y'all have younger ones, I'm going to try to make this as not gross as I can. But according to the ancient Egyptians, sexual activity was used to um, create the earth. Really, um, there there's also differences in in like, or, or there's also uh, like blood. It's usually like a bodily fluid in pagan mythos that somehow, some way, sets into motion the creation of the earth and the universe. Um, so that's a complete different uh, a difference right there. Number four, relationship between gods and humanity. According to the ancient Hebrews, Yahweh establishes covenantal relationship with humanity, particularly with the Israelites, based on obedience and faithfulness. Prophets act as intermediaries between Yahweh and the people. Ancient Sumerians, on the other hand, humans serve and appease the gods through rituals, offerings, and prayer to gain favor or avoid punishment. And guess what, guys? Sometimes it don't always work out. You can pray and pray and pray and pray, but if you're a fatalistic religion, hey, whatever's going to happen to you is going to happen to you anyway. Don't matter what kind of prayers you pray, don't matter what kind of rituals you do, you're still going to get what's coming to you. You're still going to get what has been decreed and fated by the fates or the gods. <laughs> and sorry. And sometimes like we see on Mount Carmel with Elijah specifically, what happens? You see all these people calling out to the God, right? It's Baal. And they say, Baal, Baal, come down, smote this. Uh, they, they were, they were having a contest for those who aren't familiar with the story that whoever can have their God basically call fire from heaven and, and light a, um, an altar. offering. Yep. Uh, yep. They, they had bulls. They cut them up, put them on the altar. Um, whoever could do that, that would show that their God was the true God. Right. And you see the 400 priests of Baal calling night and day, calling, 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 and nothing happens. And so just because you do something doesn't necessarily mean that God's going to respond. Um, and that was a big part of the ancient Sumerians. That's why they tried, but that's all they could really do is try. Um, 
Number five, afterlife and eschatology. This is where we've touched on earlier. Uh, the ancient Hebrews, early Hebrew beliefs in the afterlife were initially vague, um, according to the Bible, um, with a focus on the importance of life on earth and a place called Sheol where all souls, good or bad, uh, would go after death and await resurrection and final judgment. See Job 19, 25 through 27. Psalm 48, 15 through 16 in the Septuagint, Isaiah 26, 19, and Daniel 12, 2. But the ancient Sumerians, on the other hand, believed in the underworld, Kerr, where souls of the dead went after life. The afterlife was a gloomy existence without the vibrancy of earthly life. And so not at all what, and as we described earlier, in what the Jews thought specifically about eternal punishment, there's a complete difference. And so you take the vague kind of similarities between the ancient Hebrews and the ancient Sumerians, right, in Mesopotamian religion, and you see, yeah, there's a little bit of overlap there, but then you get into the differences, which is what I believe sets all of these things apart uh, and sets both of these religions on complete different ends of the spectrum that you cannot say, Professor Dave, that they copied or that they recycled these myths. There's too many differences. And I just listed the top five. There's more. There's a lot more to it. Um, but that's really it. Um, you don't you don't get this notion that would somehow like just surprise Christians that, well, yeah, there's some overlap here but it's not enough to really mean anything. There's nothing in the overlap that makes me have this like crisis of faith 